Hi, uh, Jeff Hunt. Uh, very pleased to be with Dr. Dale Klein, uh, Vice Chancellor of the University of Texas System, former Chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for the United States, and also currently the Chairman of TEPCO's Nuclear Reform Monitoring Committee. Dr. Klein, thanks for uh, being with me today. Uh, I want to start off and just go back in time uh, when the original accident happened at Fukushima. Uh, you were here you know, in the United States at the time. Just talk to me a little bit about you know, kind of what the impact was of that accident on the whole nuclear industry globally. Well, Jeff, I think what's interesting is that as a project unfolded, I think we all thought it would stop and never uh, advance to the extent that it did. So early on, we knew the earthquake occurred, we knew their safety equipment kicked in, and so we thought it was going to be cooled, and then all of a sudden this 50-foot wave comes in and does all the damage. So I think that kind of an aspect where you, first time ever, had a natural event that caused such damage to a nuclear plant was eye-opening for the world. It certainly was eye-opening for TEPCO. And you've commented in the past that the construction of the plant actually withstood the earthquake itself. The plant actually did very well. It, uh, uh, all the safety systems worked, uh, what they found today going back in time. The safety systems did in fact work. What was unexpected was that high tsunami water that flooded everything. They also had an unusual event for TEPCO because in general TEPCO does a very good job on earthquake for their off-site power. They had a very unusual shifting of land that took that off-site power off. So this is as bad as it gets in a nuclear industry where you lose on-site, off-site, and then you lose your diesels, your batteries. And so when that occurs, if your plant is operating full power, you will melt fuel. Now very shortly after the accident, uh, you were basically asked to come on board and help TEPCO really understand what happened, but more importantly, help TEPCO learn from the, uh, the accident uh, and, and really drive a whole change uh, agenda. And it was the formation of the Nuclear Reform Monitoring Committee, which you chair. Can you just talk a little bit about that initiative? Sure, what, what happened, TEPCO has great engineers. Uh, engineers are engineers. Uh, they tend to want to know everything before they say anything. So TEPCO uh, typically did a lot of technical analysis. They also have the, the Asian culture of saving face where they didn't want to say anything until they knew all the answers. In today's world, you can't do that. So I think what caught a lot of people by surprise was the poor communication coming out of TEPCO. The people that worked at the plant were heroes. I mean, they worked uh, 24 hours, seven days a week and to try to save the plant. But the uh, communication was extremely weak. Uh, the other thing that is a challenge within the Japanese culture is the hierarchical chain of command. So if your boss says to do something, even though you think it may be wrong, you're going to do it. So we needed to change their culture and we needed to change their communication. And, and in particular, not to put too much of a punctuation on it, but the safety culture. The safety culture where they didn't have a questioning attitude was a real issue. And mm -hmm. so that's where I think we've spent the most time on the Nuclear Reform Monitoring Committee to get them to understand it's okay to ask questions, it's okay to challenge. And the way we're sort of looking at that is, what do the people need to do to protect the plant? They can do that, whereas they can't criticize each other. So if they focus on the plant, I believe that we can get that nuclear safety culture that will work in the Japanese system. And how receptive have uh, leadership at TEPCO been to your oversight? Um, I think the leadership, Jeff, has been awesome. You know, they, they got it early on. They knew they had to change. They knew they had to be better communicating. They knew they had to change their safety culture. So the top management, when you look at uh, the CEO, Harris san you look at the chief nuclear officer, anagawa san you know, those individuals at the top level got it quick. The challenge is how do you get that safety culture to permeate the organization? And that's going to take time. And so, where have you seen the best and the greatest progress, both in terms of safety culture, but also communications? You know, I think one of the best safety, demonstrating safety culture was the case of uh, Kashiwazaki Kariwa, where they basically had uh, some parallel phone or cable lines that should not have been as close as they were. They identified them, they admitted it, and they took corrective action. So, that's one example of uh, where the safety culture is taking force. The other one was during the fuel movement out of Unit 4, 
where they actually, after they did one movement, they stopped the process, they asked everyone, what could we do better? How were we doing it safely? What improvements? So those kinds of examples demonstrate the safety culture is starting to get ingrained across the board. Now I know one of the things that you've stressed uh, is this greater sense of transparency, particularly as it relates to public communications. Talk to us a little bit about some of the things that you've recommended in that regard, both within Japan, but then also outside of Japan. TEPCO was probably one of the least transparent open organizations. It's just that's inherent, I think, both in the, the technical community of Japan and in the Japanese culture, saving face and all those things. So clearly, Fukushima demonstrated they needed to enhance their communication, their transparency, and their openness. TEPCO is going to have to regain the public trust in Japan, and the only way you're going to do that is to be open, transparent, and forthcoming. So we're seeing examples now. When they find problems, they will talk about it. But early on, they had a very challenging time of not admitting problems, not addressing them, uh, saying that they had everything was uh, under control. So we're seeing evidence where they're actually admitting issues, telling the public much quicker that they've had a problem and what they intend to do to solve it. Areas though where they still need to work on is they need to put it in a perspective of the human interface. So for example, uh, being a nuclear reactor person, if someone tells me it's so many millirems, I get it. The general public, that's gonna be a foreign concept. So you have to put things in perspective. So rather than, than do a data dump, which they're still doing, you need to put it in terms that the public can understand. So they still need to improve, and, and but they're getting there. So on November 22nd, um, you know, there was a 7.4 magnitude earthquake pretty much in the same location. Uh, fortunately, the, uh, the tsunami uh, that, that resulted was much, much smaller. You were in an interesting place. You were actually on the other side of the, of the, uh, the world. In fact, you were very close to Tokyo, I believe. You were in Seoul. Uh, so talk to me a little bit about what was happening, because obviously, given your position on the Nuclear Reform Monitoring Committee, when something like this occurs, everybody wants to talk to you media and other ones. So tell me what happened and how you handled the whole situation. Well, the challenge was uh, when you're 35,000 feet in the air, it's, it's hard to do an on-camera interview. Right. Uh, so what was really uh, interesting is being able to be connected real time helped a lot. So as I was flying across the ocean, I knew there was the uh, tsunami, I knew there was an earthquake a tsunami predicted. Uh, so we're able to determine early on that it was not likely to be a significant event. However, this is where TEPCO had to be responsive. So we were sending emails back and forth telling them how to communicate, what the issues, uh, how to get a message out quickly that people could understand so that the public would gain confidence and trust that there was not really an emergency. And, uh, and then when I landed, then I uh, did an interview with uh, CNBC Asia uh, right away. And, and that again, I think reinforced that the TEPCO and the Japanese system is doing better at transparency, responding to the public, responding to the inquiries. Yeah, it was interesting because we were kind of here getting things ready, so the ability to have at least a brief conversation with you so that we could start getting you know, key messages together and, and then start the monitoring and listening to kind of understand how people are reacting so that by the time you landed, we had a pretty good sense of what were some of the key things that you needed to discuss, and I think it had kind of a calming effect. Uh, yeah, I, I think it did. In fact, it were, uh, you know, the clips that, that CNBC put out and then the uh, printed version uh, was a calming influence. And then the fact that Lake Barrett, uh, you were also able to help him, give him some talking points. And, and he did that while I was in the air. So right. I think both of those responses helped calm unnecessary fears. So if you look at the two accidents, roughly three, three and a half years apart, obviously the second one uh, was not an accident in terms of the plant, but in terms of TEPCO's response, what are some of the things that you observed, uh, both positive and perhaps maybe there, where there are still some more challenges? It was probably 180 degrees out of phase, uh, and I think uh, through the help of you telling them how to communicate, they were responsive quick. Uh, they were using uh, electronic media as opposed to just print. Uh, they were sending out tweets, they were sending out messages, so I think they responded uh, much better. Again, I think they need to work on putting it in perspective so that the average person can understand what those are. They're still doing a data dump as opposed to information exchange. You know, they, they really need to work a little bit more on that. But they were much more timely. Uh, and I would say they were a lot more proactive. Uh, 
TEPCO still tends to be just reactive. They, they wait for questions rather than getting their message out early. So I, I think uh, the areas they need to work on still is being a little bit more proactive. Uh, the Japanese culture tends to be calm, reserved, and, and sort of TEPCO's vision is we just respond to questions. They can't do that anymore. This is an area they need to be proactive. Dr. Klein, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Always Jeff. a pleasure.